and welcome to the Stan Simpson Show, a program about Connecticut people and compelling issues. Make it a point to drop in every week. We are beginning a new year, 2012, and while many are looking to the future, some are still hung up on the past. Clinical psychologist Dr. Darlene Powell Garlington joined us for a talk about the symptoms of depression and, more importantly, how to overcome them. They will wrap things up with some political chatter, a round table of pundits and insiders will give their thoughts about a bump in the president's uh, poll numbers and a much anticipated race in Connecticut for Joe Lieberman's Senate seat. But first, many people are not exactly surging into the new year. Dr. Darlene Powell Garlington, clinical psychologist, welcome back. Thank you. Nice uh, to be here. Nice to be here. Big issue, right? A lot of yeah. folks looking forward to a 2012, but a hidden story, so many folks not looking forward because they're too busy looking backwards. Talk about that. How pervasive is that problem? It's pretty pervasive, Stan, because a lot of people get overwhelmed around the holidays. Some of them are triggered by memories of the past. So they can't really move forward because they're preoccupied with things that they can't seem to resolve or get over. So when it's seasonal depression, a lot of times it's heightened or exacerbated by stress, the financial conditions in our country now. They want to be able to provide or do certain things around the holidays, and they feel inhibited because of those kind of barriers. So it really is helping people to identify what it is that's interfering with them and causing them to have signs and symptoms of depression. It's called the doldrums, right? In yes, your book, it is. you talk about that blooming again. You talk about some strategies to get out of those doldrums. So, where do you begin? You have the doldrums, you know you're feeling bad, you're not looking forward, um, you have the hurt of the past. How do you get started? When do you begin to say, okay, um, I have to do this? The first step is almost like differential diagnosis because we can have major depression or major depressive disorder, which is more severe. It's like having pneumonia. And then you could have a cold, which is more like dysthymia, which is like now, underlying. you a lot of these clinical terms. I miss a, I miss a little old layman here. Okay. So you got to bring them terms down. I'm going to break it down. <laughs> it's pneumonia. You're going to have major depression, which is you're having a lot of feelings of helplessness. You feel like you can't have pleasure in any activities, irritability. You might not want to get out of bed. So it's really severe. Then dysthymic disorder is like being melancholy, just walking around feeling a certain sense of sadness, like a cloud over your head, a sense of gloom and doom. Is it but you're functioning. Is it, is it a form of depression? Are it we is. talking about that? Absolutely. Well, let's, let's, talk about this. let's switch gears go to the symptoms first. Let's yes. talk about depression and talk about the symptoms. You mentioned sort of the sleep disorders. You're not sleeping right. Mm -hmm. You're well, not sleeping too much. Okay. One at the extreme or the other. So if you find mm -hmm. yourself doing that or see others sleeping too much or not enough, could be a sign of a problem. What else now as far as symptoms? If you feel that you're in the doldrums, if you feel that you could be clinically depressed but you're not really sure, isolation you say is something else to look out for. Uh, talk about that. When you see people who all of a sudden don't want to engage in activities that they used to enjoy, they used to have fun going out and socializing, getting together to go out to dinner and have a drink, and all of a sudden they don't want to. Or the extremes of eating. You'll find people who all of a sudden don't have an appetite, they mm. can't eat. Or they're self-medicating with food or drink or alcohol. And sometimes we'll have, again, a kind of clinical term, co-occurring disorders or co comorbidity, where you have somebody who's, somebody who's <laughs> depressed, but in addition to being depressed, they're also anxious or they also have a substance abuse problem. So because they're depressed, they're eating more, they're taking a kind of drug, or they're having a lot of anxiety. So they're kind of interrelated. So the first thing is to kind of get a sense of what's more predominant, what's really going on with this person. And if it is the depressive symptoms, what can we do to help them to feel a greater sense of joy and satisfaction? in life. Let me bring you back to isolation. Yes. Right? What's the difference between isolation and getting some me time? Some folks, you know, you read from psychology, you're supposed to get some me time. Mm -hmm. How do you know when it's me time versus you're being too isolated? That's a great question. I think it's frequency and duration. If you find that a person who usually is outgoing, gregarious, can't wait to hang out, all of a sudden doesn't want to go anywhere and it's happening for a prolonged period of time, I'd be concerned. But you're right, I love my me time. Mm. So if I say I'm going to a spa, I create a spa environment in my own home and I want to stay in for a day or two, then that's a healthy thing. It's kind of rejuvenating and replenishing yourself so right. that you can function better. So you're right. That's so different than being in a cave and holding yourself up, yes. turning the shades off. That's different than going to a spa or yes. doing something that you're alone, but it's something therapeutic versus just staying at home and sort of thinking about the past. Exactly. Right? And you know, we know the tone sometimes. If you know 
know the person. And that's the most important thing, a sense of connectedness. Like, I even know you well enough. So if I'm talking to you on the phone and you're sounding kind of sad and melancholy, I can get a sense whether it's that or you're just saying, look, I need to chill. I need some time just to myself to chillax and, and have a good time and just be comfortable with me, be introspective, get a better sense of what my future, what my maybe my um, New Year's resolutions will be. So I need some time to think about that. So it's really being able to tell that from that person. And that's where closeness comes in. You always have to have a sense of connectedness with somebody. I know when I'm feeling kind of down about something, if I have friends who can identify that and I have that close connection, it's like a lifeline. A lot of friends, though, they see you in that melancholy mood. They don't know how to interconnect. They don't know whether to leave you alone or right. engage. So what, what do you tell friends who see somebody who's got the blahs and, and maybe they're uh, isolating and that friend is like, well, I want to give them their space. When do you know as a friend when it's time to intervene and when you step back? Well, it's really important to know what your friend's preferences are, what they like to do. Like if I'm feeling a little frustrated and I go to a movie, I can really look kind of just get lost in the movie. It's a way of just really being able to relax and, and escape from the reality of everything going on that might be stressful. So my friends will know, let's take it to a movie. So know your friends. If your friend likes to go shopping and just kind of window shopping, a museum, they might want to go and do something that's giving to other people, um, finding children. I know that a lot of people, when they interact with children, it's therapeutic. Mm. Just being able to see the joy to engage. That and engage with the child. We've got two minutes left. I want to go through these pretty quickly. Sure. Self-medicating, yes. right? Fine line there between that third glass of wine and somebody who's self-medicating. When do you know that you're crossing that line between being a casual drinker um, and get yourself into trouble. There are even inventories that could help with that. And a lot of them are right on the web. But you should know yourself, too. Like, if you feel like you're needing that drink in order to relax, it's okay to have a, a drink every now and then in moderation. There's no problem whatsoever. But if you think that you're becoming dependent on that, mm -hmm. that you can't really allow yourself to relax and enjoy unless you have that drink, then you know that it's probably a problem. Right, we've that you talked need about to symptoms in a minute left. Yes. We talked about symptoms. Yes. Anger is one symptom also. Now let's talk about moving forward. We have some uh, mm -hmm. tips on how to begin to move forward out of those doldrums. First step is to acknowledge the, the pain, right? Yes. Very difficult. What do you mean by that? Like processing. You have to be in touch with yourself enough and honest and genuine to be able to say, I'm in pain. Okay. And but, 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 you know, then what? Because most people can mm -hmm. acknowledge, okay, I'm depressed, I'm in pain, but now then what? Cause I, you, well, number two, you have is set expectations. How do you begin to move from oh, saying, okay, gee, I'm really in pain here, I'm hurting, but um, how do I now set goals? How do I make that first step to say, okay, let me step out of that pain? Great question, because as psychologists, we might call it cognitive behavioral therapy. We do it every day. We might call it that, but it's changing, sometimes changing our behaviors will change our thoughts and feelings. So if you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling sad, if you go out and do something, if you give to other people, if you get engaged in activities, you'll begin to see that your mood changes. So changing our behavior can lead to changing in our thoughts and in our feelings. In about 15 seconds. So yes. engaging people is a good goal to set. Uh, don't isolate. We talked about that. Pamper yourself. Yes. Uh, we'll go back to that Do real quickly. 10 fun. seconds. You mentioned a uh, spa. I believe something. in holistic health. Mm -hmm. So mind, body, and spirit. Change your thinking to affirmations, positive things. Exercise. Do something to keep yourself physically fit. And our faith, our spiritual life. Have a sense of joy. Have a sense of um, our perspective and how that's going to impact us. If we have faith and belief that things are going to get better, they will get better. And quickly, you're a big believer in light, L-I-G-H-T, that's important to have some light, you're saying, yes. because if you don't have Seasonal light... Seasonal affective disorder happens for a lot of people, too, and that's because we don't have the sunlight during this time of year. So there's artificial light sometimes that will help people. There, there are clinical trials that demonstrate that if people have that kind of light, it can enhance their mood and they begin to feel better. All Absolutely. Right. Appreciate it very much. Dr. Appreciate Darlene Powell-Garlington, the author of Blooming Again, Overcoming Adversity. When we come back, folks, we'll talk about a bump in in President Obama's poll numbers and whether it could be the beginning of a surge as election 2012 gets underway. You are